Thank you for joining us for the final webinar of the spring semester. I'm really excited to have our panel of experts today with us. And uh, we'll just give the attendees two minutes to join. I see we're, our attendee list is growing. And I will start to share my screen with you. Okay, let's get started. So um, thank you for joining us. Today, our discussion is about the federal legalization of cannabis, and we'll be discussing the environmental and policy implications of this monumental shift. I'd like to thank the Resources Legacy Fund, uh, the University of California Division of Agricultural and Natural Resources, Berkeley Rassauer, the Campbell Foundation, the Bureau of Cannabis Control, UC Berkeley Sci Social Science Matrix. Uh, thank you for making our research possible. The Cannabis Research Center promotes interdisciplinary scholarship on the social and environmental dimensions of cannabis. Through scientific research and engagement with community, government, and academic entities, we advance understanding of cannabis in socio-ecological systems at local, national, and global scales. My name is Laura Herrera. I'm a community-based researcher and a, a multimedia specialist working to support the center in our shared goal to inform public dialogue and contribute to the development of prosperous, equitable communities and healthy environments. So because we're so firmly rooted in the environmental sciences, it's important for us to do a land acknowledgement. And as I thought about um, an honorable way to do this, I actually have a visual guide that I wanted to share with you. So I found this organization called Canyon Consulting. Um, they're a group that is, has a mission to bridge the gap between indigenous and contemporary value systems. They're located here in the Bay Area. And they have this really beautiful map of the ancestral lands and people of California. And you can see from north to south, there are a lot of different overlapping language groups that made up the ancestral lands. And you can see where my cursor is circling. This is Ohlone territory where the University uh, of Berkeley is located. So um, in the Ohlone language group, there's almost 10 other unique language groups um, with their own unique cultures and tribal traditions. So if we look at another map of California, and this is from a respected uh, publication called Leafly. We can see how the colonization framework is literally placed on top of ancestral lands and, and peoples. And so we can st still see how these groups um, are different. And based on this map showing the variations of legalization in the state, uh, every region remains unique. And so uh, this has undoubted, undoubtedly shaped the local political systems, the geographic and cultural variations across the state. And we can only imagine the diversity and complexity of each individual state in the United States and the chaos of a national attempt to monopolize discipline and legitimize cannabis. Um, on our panel of experts today, we have Omar Figueroa, founder and principal turn, attorney of his law offices and member of um, and founder of diverse organizations like the National Cannabis Industry Association, the Cannabis Travel Association, uh, Can California Cannabis Tourism Association, um, and the Cannabis Banking uh, Organization. And, oh, and the National Cannabis Bar Association. Bar Association, <laughs> oh, apologies. There's and not a Cannabis Banking Association yet, but soon there will be, I imagine. Yes. Um, we also have Nina Parks, who's the chair of the San Francisco Cannabis Oversight Committee. She's also a member of the Cannabis uh, Regula Regulators of Color Coalition, the original equity group. Um, and we also have uh, Cristal Gallegos, who is a commercial grower with experience in Arizona and California, and an organizer for labor rights and social justice in cannabis cultivation. I guess I'll just tell you a little bit about uh, my background and... Uh... And then you can, you can just click through the different, you know, I went to uh, Yale College, studied philosophy, uh, which made me fit for driving a cab and going to law school. So I chose the law school route. After law school, I focused on freedom defense and I chose the creme de la creme of uh, criminal defendants who are uh, cannabis cultivators, the nicest, most peaceful, 
And then uh, also like, you know, likely to do their homework and stay out of trouble, uh, defendants out there. I've defended um, cannabis defendants for more than 20 years. I've gone to Jerry Spence's trial lawyers college in, at a ranch in Wyoming. I'm also a founding lifetime member of the International Cannabis Bar Association, which is a bar association for legal professionals all across the world who are practicing cannabis law globally. Um, I'm also a director of the Cannabis Travel Association International, formerly known as the um, California Cannabis Travel Association. When we started out, there was tremendous interest in uh, tourism from all over the world. So the organization pivoted and became international. I'm also a director of the National Cannabis Industry Association. And finally, I'm also um, a chapter leader with the Sonoma County chapter of the ACLU of Northern California. And um, next slide, please. I'm also um, a legal author and I created a, um, you know, numerous books that have chronicled the evolution of cannabis law over the years. We're in our fifth edition for the California book and there's a brand new um, edition. And I'm happy to make a donation to the uh, Berkeley Cannabis Research Center of the complete set of books. I recently did the same for Humboldt State. And I'm really happy to see that cannabis studies is becoming its own uh, you know, branch of study with like an interdisciplinary focus. Um, and so this is, you know, very exciting for me to be part of this. Um, so thank you for inviting me. Uh, Laura, thank you for putting this together and curating this awesome uh, seminar. Next slide, please. Now we're gonna go over the terminology. <clears throat> so Prop 215 is the Compassionate Use Act of 1996. And it was a voter initiative that was enacted in 1996. And it was the birth of the cannabis reform movement um, of the modern cannabis reform movement globally. Um, Prop 215 had, you know, the, the doctor's recommendation or approval was necessary in order to uh, have a defense under Prop 215. And um, these were not prescriptions because under um, federal law, a prescription cannot be made for a Schedule One controlled substance. So they adopted a different terminology, recommendation, meaning the doctor recommended the cannabis, approval, meaning that the patient brought up existing cannabis use and the doctor said, go ahead, I'm okay with that. And uh, those you, uh, were called scripts, you know, which is a technically incorrect name, but it used to denote, you know, uh, written recommendations or approvals. Interestingly, they did not have to be in writing. There could be oral recommendations and oral approvals, uh, and they still are. Prop 215 is still in effect. Uh, the cooperative model is something that's no longer in effect. This was something that was born in 2004 uh, with Senate Bill 420, and it allowed patients and caregivers to associate cooperatively in order to cultivate cannabis. And so it really allowed for the large groups of patients and caregivers to start growing cannabis. There was no limit on the number of um, members of a cooperative. And, um, you know, that was kind of the, the birth of like the modern cannabis industry. We went from Prop 215, where it was focused just on patients and caregivers growing their own to now a defense for cooperatives. Compassionate care um, was not really required by the law, but it was like, I, those were like programs that were put in place by collectives and cooperatives in order to have a strong legal defense in, in the event of, um, you know, contact with law enforcement. You know, uh, it was very easy for very ill patients to get compassionate care because they were often adopted by collectives and cooperatives as part of their legal defense. Uh, Proposition 64 is the Adult Use of Marijuana Act, which passed in 2000. 16, and this was a voter initiative that was funded by an internet billionaire, and it quasi-legalized cannabis in California uh, by reducing most cannabis felonies to misdemeanors. It did not legalize cannabis. Those crimes are still on the books. Appalachians was a um, legal framework passed into California law, which allows for the registration and designation of official Appalachians of origin. Uh, and these are like wine appellations, basically geographical areas where uh, specific cannabis uh, standards, practices, or cultivars 
are going to be used within that particular appellation and get official recognition. Uh, the appellation system we have in California is uh, terroir based. And so that means that it is compatible with the international appellation system. Uh, terroir basically means that, you know, it's, it's a French word and it, it means land. And the best way to explain terroir is to understand that, you know, a product is an expression of the place. And so you could use the exact same genetics, exact same techniques in a different part of the, of the world and you're not gonna get the same product. And that's because that product is an expression of the particular geographical um, you know, features of the place, including like the soil conditions, the wind, the humidity, the uh, mm. rainfall, all of those are part of the terroir. <clears throat> Varietals, cultivars and strains are, are you know, basically reference are uh, synonyms and they just designate the different types of cannabis that there are. Uh, you know, let's say, you know, there's a, a blueberry versus a haze versus a jack herer versus another light. You know, these are all common names for, uh, you know, varietals of, or cultivars of cannabis. And there is not yet an official designation of what is an official, um, you know, definition of these varietals. And so these are market terms and they're, you know, the same name could refer to very different plants. Um, in California, we have the supply chain, you know, what that's based on different license types, and it starts with uh, cultivation. And for cultivation, there's three different types. There's indoor cultivation, um, which basically means like with artificial lights, outdoor cultivation with no artificial lights and no artificial darkness, and then mixed light cultivation, which is a combination of either um, artificial lights or artificial darkness. Um, and then the other, other license types are manufacturing. That's, that includes extracting or infusing or packaging cannabis goods. Uh, distribution, the distributor in California is meant to be like a surrogate tax collector and, and work at collecting the um, cultivation tax from the cultivators or manufacturers and then the um, excise tax from the retailers. There's also required laboratory testing of all cannabis in California. And there's a separate license type called the laboratory testing license. Um, mm -hmm. And somebody who holds a lab testing license cannot hold any other type of license. They're supposed to be the referees standing neutral from the game. Uh, retail, there's different types. There's storefront retail, as well as delivery only non-storefront retail. Some storefront retailers can engage in delivery, um, you know, and a lot of that depends on the local uh, permits. But basically the state licenses two types, um, storefront and non-storefront retail. Cannabis events, this is like a regulatory license that was created by our Bureau of Cannabis Control and it allows for um, events where cannabis can be sold and consumed by adults ages 21 and over. Uh, but all of the cannabis has to be um, go through the metric system and follow the other requirements. And uh, that's it for terminology. Next slide, please. Um, a quick time. And so until 1996, cannabis was still very illegal with no medical defense. Uh, um, you know, so a cultivation of a single plant, felony, possession of a gram, with intent to sell, felony, sale of a gram, sale of any amount, felony. Uh, and it was not until 1996 that the Compassionate Use Act, known as Prop 215, legalized cannabis for medical use. A medical recommendation or approval was needed, um, but it did not have to be in writing. You could have oral approvals or oral recommendations. And then it only allowed for patients and primary caregivers. That was a very strict language of the statute. Um, you know, just by comparison, uh, Prop 215 was um, like, you know, a couple of pages compared to Prop 64 in 2016, which was more than 60 pages. So um, Prop 215 was a very narrow defense. In 2004, the legislature passed Senate Bill 420, and it allowed for state of ID, 
identification cards for medical marijuana patients and also allowed for default quantities that patients could have statewide, which was like half a pound uh, with one of those state ID cards and with immunity from arrest, which was new. It also gave limited immunity from prosecution, but not from arrest for collectives and cooperatives. <clears throat> and that was, um, you know, that, that created like a whole cannabis industry where basically, um, you know, there was small collectives where people were like really all working together to grow their own cannabis and huge collectives and cooperatives like Harborside with tens of thousands of patients who didn't really know each other. And with cultivation where, you know, the cultivation was really happening for a stack of scripts, um, you know, and that was an unregulated laissez-faire capitalism system that really was born in 2004 and went full strength until 2019. It was a 15 year run for the collective and cooperative system. In 2010, we had, um, you know, Proposition 19 on the ballot. And that's when Governor Schwarzenegger proposed Senate Bill 1449, which became law and resulted in the defeat of Proposition 19. And what that did is it quasi decriminalized possession of up to one ounce. Um, you know, after Senate Bill 1449, possession of up to one ounce became an infraction with a $100 fine before it was a misdemeanor with a $100 fine, no jail time. And so the real change was no jury trial. You know, like you used to uh, get a full uh, misdemeanor jury trial on possession of less than an ounce and after Senate Bill 1449, no more. So I don't really see that as like a big reform, but it was basically an attempt to successfully defeat Proposition 19. Um, people kept trying with other voter initiatives. And 2016, um, we had the legislative legislature um, passed the Medical Cannabis Regulation and Safety Act, which established the Bureau of Medical Marijuana Regulation known as BUMMER. It was an unfortunate acronym. Um, and this was a dual licensing system. Both a local permit and a state license were required to operate. And we still have that dual licensing system. 2016, we have uh, the successful voter initiative, the Adult Use of Marijuana Act, and it legalized non-medical cannabis for adults ages 21 and over. It um, maintained the dual licensing system and it reduced criminal penalties. It did not legalize marijuana. 2017, we had the Medicinal and Adult Use Cannabis Regulation Safety Act, MAUCURSA, and that combined both medical and adult use regulatory systems. So we wouldn't have one set of regulations for medical and a different set for medical. They all have the same regulations and that's what we have in place. And it also has dual and bifurcated licensing, meaning you got to get a local permit in order to get a state license. Thanks. So now we'll move on to Nina Parks, who as um, somebody who's working with the city of San Francisco and also with national organizations such as the um, Cannabis Regulators of Color, um, Give us your perspective on federal legalization, on the pending legalization that we see come. I'll share my slides with you right now. Perfect. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Nina Parks. Um, since we are doing land acknowledgments, I was also born and raised. Uh, here in occupied Ohlone territory, uh, which is San Francisco, California. Um, my background in cannabis, and just to give you guys some more context, I was an operator during 215. I had a delivery service. Um, I helped to organize with uh, um, the California Growers Association. Um, I co-founded an organization called Supernova Women, um, as well as the other uh, organizations that uh, was mentioned before, which is the Cannabis Regulators of Color, which is the most recent one, uh, and uh, um, the original equity group. Both uh, Supernova Women and the original equity group, we did a lot of education as the conversations were happening around um, adult use legalization, and we helped to inform the equity programs that are now in existence um, in our in our localities here in California. There's no exact statewide program yet. Um, and then we're seeing a, um, we're seeing a 
equity programs pop up all over the United States. So I the, the slides that we have here, right, um, particularly we're looking at how equity can be legislated at a, at a, um, at a federal level, right? But then also like what, like what is implementation going to look like? Um, we have here that representatives Booker, Wyden and Schumer are, are looking to present a bill it's not necessarily fully shaped yet, but they do have an idea for um, a, a bill that is led by social equity framework. Um, the Joyce bill, can you remind us, Omar, what the Joyce bill is? Um, it basically would deschedule cannabis and it basically looks like a nice version of the MORE Act, you know, with right. a focus on, on um, veterans. Right. This is the Republican bill that just popped up out of nowhere right after uh, Booker, Wyden, and Schumer had said that they wanted to propose a new bill. As the Democrats, the Republicans uh, proposed this bill, and it was all on the heels of the MORE Act. So we saw the MORE Act pass at the end of last year through Congress. One of the big reasons why they pushed it through Congress is because they felt like it was going to be one of the most progressive Congresses that they saw. They didn't know if it was going to look the same on this on this round. So just to be able to keep um, the conversation on the table, they really wanted to push it forward. However, we saw a lot of um, we saw a lot of conflict with existing cannabis equity groups. A lot of uh, um, most of them black and brown run organizations where one, they were they felt like their voices were co-opted for the bill. Um, and then amendments were made right before it hit the floor. Um, and uh, most of everybody, uh, my groups included, felt very betrayed by the process. Um, what that process was is that uh, all regulatory language in the bill had been previously looked like uh, lumped together under uh, the, you know, like this assumption that cannabis was going to uh, be added into the tobacco ordinance and it was going to be regulated like tobacco. So what uh, the, the, the judicial committee did before it hit the floors, they cut, cut and pasted language from the tobacco language. And within that language, there was exclusion, there's felony exclusions, right? So everything, all of their findings that the Moore Act had presented pre, like previously were all counteracted when they put the provisions in around felony exclusion. Um, and when we had conversations that we as activists had uh, uh, conversations with our leadership, they uh, had said, <laughs> um, yeah, we cut and pasted it, but I guess the problem with cutting, cutting and pasting is that you also cut and paste systemic racism as well. We're like, wow, okay, that's a revelation. That is a huge revelation. So if you can go to my next slide um, before we, we'll jump back to this one with the questions, but I'm um, oh, sorry, one more, one more down. This one, we'll start here and we'll go to the next one. So the intersectionality of cannabis policy with other policies, right? Because ca cannabis touches so many different areas. So when we talk about cannabis policy, we're really talking about criminal justice policy. We're talking about public policy within like, how, like what happens um, with the interaction of cannabis in the public, right? We're talking about economic policy. It's like what frameworks um, and who is able to participate based on how the policy is written. We're talking about education policy, we're talking about health policy, and we're talking about environmental policy because it still is an agricultural product and it does have impacts on our environment. Also, the impacts of packaging is a whole different thing that we need to talk about. But um, these are the lenses one should look like, should view through as we're talking about cannabis policy. Cannabis policy is not a monolith. It is a, at the intersection of many different discussions. Right, so we can't we can't look at cannabis policy as just like oh people want to legalize weed, right? And as Omar had um, wonderfully illustrated in um, in the con conversation be uh, before, which is the whole timeline of like how we got to where we're at, right? And it didn't happen in a silo. It happened um, with you know conversations about 
criminal justice conversations about the needs in the healthcare system, conversations with the needs of like mental health support and other things for our veterans, right? Um, as well as people with chronic illness. So if we can go one slide up. So a ready framework, right? Which is a racial equity, diversity, inclusion framework um, has the built like as the overall lens has the ability to help us look at cannabis policy through its impacts, right? So when we talk about racial equity, diversity, and inclusion, we have to ask ourselves questions like, who is helped by this policy? Who is harmed by this policy? Um, who gets to participate in the implementation of this policy? Who are the decision makers, right? What kind of decisions are they making and for what communities? Do those communities have input, right? Um, those would be some key things to think about um, and key things that we try to think about um, in San Francisco when, we're, when we are approaching um, the cannabis equity framework, right? So again, Oakland and San Francisco has had the longest um, time, so three years to be able to implement our policy, like our policy around racial equity, diversity, and inclusion through our equity programs. Um, and we're seeing other localities slowly come on. Um, actually, just last week, we had a conversation in Sacramento um, where we had to show up to the, uh, to the supervisors meeting over there to get them to extend the equity program, right? It's not, so these things are, are still being um, hammered out. So at a federal level, right? At a federal level, if any policy goes like uh, goes forward, we really, really, really need influencers, lawmakers, people that are approaching and advocating to advocate through these multiple lenses. Again, um, encasing the entire cannabis policy with all the other impacts around criminal justice, workforce development, economic policy, uh, education, health, and health policy. Um, which I know some of those bullet, like some of those little circles are a little bit different than the ones before, but um, still the lenses are super, super important. Going up one more slide, um, Laura. Oh, sorry, um, to the to the questions around um, the pending policy. There we go. So the you know, so these are right now, what are the federal legalization impacts on local and state and on the state levels, right? So does um, what is being presented by the Joyce bill, the Booker, White, and Schumer bill, or the Moore Act, do those uh, bills enhance or do they harm what's happening at the local and state levels? What we're finding here in California in a juxtaposition to what's happening all over the United States, California is the most highly regulated um, cannabis uh, industry in the entire United States. We are also the most heavily taxed. Right. So like right now, California is being taxed at 43 percent on every pound of cannabis. Right. In the event so that so what that tax is made up of is a cultivation tax, which is a one hundred and fifty four dollars and like ninety three cents per pound. Right. So that's off off top. And then there is a 15 percent tax. Um, that's the excise tax at the consumer level as well as the eight point like nine percent sales tax um, at the retail level level as well. Um, so combined are we're being taxed at at 43 percent plus remember there's the the fees around um, your permitting around your licensing and so all of that actually really does um, create a high barrier of entry for folks into the industry. So whatever happens at the federal level, it has to decrease for it to actually be uh, in alignment with the values around uh, racial equity, diverse, diver diversity and inclusion, um, it would have to lower those barriers to entry, right? Because some of the barriers that we've been finding in regards to racial equity, diversity and inclusion is that there is problems around access to capital, access to um, to real estate, right? Because it, it also goes in with the access to capital. Um, and then uh, um, and then also going into um, the education and the support 
of navigating a system that had previously um, been set up to harm the communities that were impacted. Um, so the, these are the places that, um, and all the lenses that we're looking at when we when we view these bills. Um, the MORE Act, for the most part, has, um, has the potential to help because it sets up a fund, a community, a community reinvestment fund. Um, it sets up uh, um, pathways for people to get resources that have uh, state and local equity programs. Um, however, uh, still the devil's in the details. And so if the way that uh, cannabis is actually regulated at a federal level it mirrors um, other industries that have already been exclusionary, that is the opposite of what we're, we're, we're looking for. So we need to be very um, mindful as these bills start to get pushed forward. Um, there was a rumor that the MORE Act is supposed to be reintroduced this week. Um, if not this week, next week, and we'll see um, where where it all lands. There's a many, many stakeholders that have been chi chiming in, um, and it, we'll, we'll see it, and we're all patiently watching to see if maybe the Booker, White, and Schumer bill um, can one-up the MORE Act in, in the way that it it's um, written out to, to regulate, to lower the barriers of entry. And that's it, that's all I got. <laughs> <laughs> that was great. Thank you so much for that perspective. And these last two questions, um, especially about corporate responsibility, sustainability, and best practices, will be fully addressed by Cristal. So I want to switch to Cristal's slides and let her take over the mic. Thank you. My name is Cristal Gallegos. Super excited to be here. Um, very humbled by the, the perspectives just offered so much uh, important and dense information. And so I'm really humbled. I have a bit of a different perspective, um, sort of being an on the ground uh, laborer, but also having a background in community social racial justice organizing and specifically union organizing. Um, I'm really glad to be here and offer my perspective, um, both um, you know, anecdotally on the ground and also uh, through my organizing experience. Um, you know, I wanna just start by you know, mentioning something that I'm sure we all know, we wax poetically about you know, the historical realities. How did we get here? You know, as we know, the cannabis industry comes from such a long racist history that's really devastated so many of our communities um, in really powerful ways. And I think that this historical acknowledgement is really key and uh, foundational to understanding our current political climate and really the on the ground realities that exist and that uh, those of us on the ground are experiencing in this, in this huge market. You know, uh, oftentimes these racialized structures have left us unable to access these new businesses created by the industry. And we see ourselves often relegated to um, becoming, you know, the essential workers in this very profitable environment. Essential workers um, in the cultivation industry, we've, we've not um, ever had, you know, any shelter in place. We've worked throughout the entire pandemic, um, providing um, what is considered an essential service to the California recreational market. Um, so I had a, you know, asked a, just a couple of basic questions. How do we get here? How do we center uh, disenfranchised communities? And how do we center the role of the labor um, within these in these industries where hierarchies are very carefully structured, very racialized? Um, and particularly in the cultivation industry, I wanna focus a bit on uh, labor can go on to the next slide. Um, this is where I believe with the laborers, this is where the industry must focus um, the attention on the working conditions of these critical partners who work to cultivate, procure, and you know, care for the cannabis plant. And um, the reality is just like any large industry, um, abuse is, it, you know, can be rampant in, in, in several different ways as a former labor organizer coming into the industry, I was um, a bit surprised, um, but not because the industry is so new um, at the lack of, you know, labor, the, the presence of, of a strong labor force being in the state of California, having some of the most robust labor protections. Um, 
actually as agricultural workers, which we are designated as California um, cultivators. Um, companies are really uh, careful about reclassifying, but the bottom line is we are considered farm workers and thus are covered by the Agricultural Labor and Relations Board. Um, that also, the purview of the ALRB is a bit different from the NLRB. Um, protections are different. And because the industry is so new, it, it is a bit confusing in, in figuring out um, how, how we organize this effort. Additionally, unfortunately, labor unions can also be, you know, infected with a lot of societal ills like racism, sexism, a lot of these, these issues that we see. Um, I pointed out a case, the Cedar Point Nursery uh, versus Victoria Hassad. And this case was brought forth by the actual owners of the growers of these, these nurseries. Um, and they argued that a uh, 45 year old long protection that workers have had for uh, organizers to come into the work site during non-working hours was actually illegal and they deemed it as um, it takes their property without just compensation violation of the fifth amendment by allowing the organizers onto their consent and they challenged that all the way and saying that that's not true they're taking it to a legal extreme by not allowing their workers to know about very basic rights so the supreme court court said scheduled to hear the case this last march i tried to find updates on that i haven't i'm sure it's still in in little litigation but we should look to that in terms of how we're going to inform our organizing efforts but the bottom line is uh, there is an, an extreme need for collective bargaining rights and the access to these unique protections because we are laborers uh, we use our bodies every single day indoor cultivation um, especially at the large scale is very very intense uh, my experiences in both the state of Arizona and the state of California have been working in legal large-scale cultivation facilities while there are many parallels there are um, lots of differences differences that really um, inspire me and make me feel enthusiastic about the future of cannabis cultivation and workers' rights in the state of California, given that we do have um, a background of robust labor rights here. Um, let's see. You know, really, it's really not enough. It's I've been so inspired by seeing the equity programs and building black and brown wealth and capital. And that's incredible. But I think it's really important to uh, also focus on the worker, you know, the, the laborer and think about reparative policy within that and how we can um, kind of enter, enter a new, it's really a new world of organizing. Um, Cannabis cultivation sites are notoriously private, secretive, very difficult to organize in the typical um, external organizing type of, of way. The ways that uh, we see dispensaries, we've seen successful unionization, collective bargaining agreements in uh, dispensaries in San Francisco, such as Steezy, they want an incredible contract. And so we really want that um, in, in the cultivation world. We think that it's important to create a sustainable um, a sustainable place. We want, we want a career. We don't simply want um, an entry-level job that um, makes us expendable and really replaceable. Um, and we can move on to the next slide. So I'm trying to access it. Environmental impacts are huge. Um, I wish I could speak more to this I, other than, you know, my, of course, anecdotal experience, but working in a 50, very large, uh, cultivation site, um, water, light, electricity, our, our bill is, is huge. It's huge in the upwards of a quarter million dollars a month. Um, and in the era of fires, in the era of droughts, um, we do have to question how are cannabis cultivation sites fitting into these, these restrictions, if at all. Are we circumventing these rules, these laws? It's Additionally, you know, we have to consider the types of medium used to grow cannabis. You'll find in commercial cannabis where a lot of companies are moving away from soil or even cocoa onto rock wool. Rock wool can have in tremendous environmental impacts, not to mention health impacts on the person um, uh, working with them. Um, I think it's important that um, we incentivize uh, via BCC or otherwise sustainable practices and, uh, you know, 
like Nina mentioned, the impacts of packaging are just are beyond. But as cultivators, I think it's easy to not feel that impact because we don't we don't really work with the packaging, but we, we should be concerned about that so that we can start from the top to the bottom to create uh, re incentivized recycling methods that um, create a lot of pressure for the industry to, to be a good community partner. Um, so we're hoping that the BCC can help with this uh, sustainability uh, hopes and incentivize, especially for the larger indoor cultivation sites, uh, like the one that I work at. Um, I think that's it for me. Wow, thank you for that insight. Um, thank you. You're absolutely right. When people think um, about recreational, recreational cannabis use, um, they may not think of what's really going on in the whole supply chain. Um, so I wanted to share a few of my notes as somebody who works actively um, to support the social equity programs and the loan and grant programs that uh, channel money to uh, verified equity applicants and operators. Um, and to reiterate what Cristal said, from an environmental standpoint, uh, the governing bodies need to consider the natural resources, the water, the land, and the energy uses. Um, and it's so important to understand the nuances of cannabis agriculture um, in, when making policy. Um, we also have to really think about state oversight and local administration to track the funding um, and collect reporting from the local jurisdictions. Um, the state and local government entities need a lot of training. Uh, for the, their administrators and their regulators so that they understand everything that we've talked about today as they roll out um, cannabis programs in their, in their states. Um, we all, I hope that we can all agree on the value of reparative policy. Um, an example of this would be new states that have recently legalized cannabis for commercial use, starting their social equity programs first and then opening licensing to large commercial industries after social programs are funded and sustainable as a gauge of industry health. Um, also, in the, in the national level and management of compliance, um, this is where the business sector, the private sector and the public sector need to work together well um, to have good business operations, efficient business operations and best management practices to make sure that we eliminate barriers to entry, that there's reasonable tax and fees, supporting paths to compliance, preventing labor exploitation, maintaining product integrity and consumer safety. Um, and so new states and, and people from that are not in California, think about how much management principles and management science can help policy work better. This is research informed by data, subject matter experts like the ones that, ones that we've had today um, and proven community organizations and nonprofits who are already supporting the system. That's really important. And it's something that we've been talking about um, a lot in these webinars is supporting the community-based and, and local organizations that are already doing the work. Um, and then when we talk about law enforcement, we need to start thinking about police and how they're, are they going to be an apparatus of protection, compliance, or enforcement? Um, it seems necessary to redirect policing to white collar crime, labor violations, and uh, actually ensuring the safety of cannabis businesses from robbery instead of chasing them down to um, close their businesses. So now we're at uh, 1246 and we have time for Q&A and just engagement amongst the panelists. So if there's any questions, please feel free to drop them in the chat. Um, or we can ask questions of each other as panelists as well. I know Omar, you had some information. I couldn't exactly open that chat. You said, could you uh, share that with us? Oh, sure. That was basically a, a link to this OEA. Uh, it, it has all the US Supreme Court oral arguments. So it looks like the case you brought up has been fully briefed and the oral arguments have already happened. And so now we're just waiting for the Supreme Court opinion to be uh, issued sometime before November is usually the deadline for us to get the latest opinion. And that is a big deal because if the Supreme Court says property owners cannot have entries because that entry is considered, uh, you know, taking without just compensation, uh, then that's basically going to say unless the property owners get paid somehow, you know, compens compensated justly, uh, 
you know, union organizing cannot occur on site. And uh, that's going to present huge practical difficulties for union organizers. You know, the, this is a type of uh, case that with this Supreme Court that we have currently, I would be concerned about because they don't seem to be bound by precedent and are willing to, you know, engage in uh, decisions that are kind of untethered from, you know, their previous decisions. So we do have a question in the chat. Uh, and the question is, are there aspects of California policy that you hope will make it into federal law? And that follow-up question is, are there aspects you hope federal law will change? Open to anybody. Yes. I mean, I think definitely like um, the aspects of California policy that I hope will make it into federal law are like few because I think California is over-regulating cannabis. So you know, I maybe like standardizing like the laboratory testing on a nationwide basis could be something that would be helpful. But other than that, like stay out of the way and let the states regulate cannabis because that's the way our democracy is set up. The states are supposed to be the laboratories of democracy where we can run all, you know, 50 simultaneous experiments, hopefully more than that with DC and Puerto Rico statehood, uh, but we can run more than 50 experiments to see like what the best way is to regulate cannabis. And in a free market, you really should have minimal regulation and allow like the, um, you know, competition to determine who the winners are, not heavy regulation. And those who are fortunate enough to have venture capital and family offices and private equity and private wealth are the ones who under this current over-regulated system are, are the ones who have the advantage. And, so, and it's really an advantage to fail. Like they, they have um, enough resources that allows them to fail and then try again. Yes, Whereas, they have a long runway, right? Like have, the whole concept of runway is really alien to most small business owners because you don't have a runway. You can't operate at a loss for, you know, a few years, a few months while you figure it out. And so, you know, yes, having a runway is the way many of these like big cannabis companies are operating. And that highlights the lack of uh, generational wealth equity you know, that's the issue there. I mean, the reason that, you know, people of color don't have like the same type of wealth to play in the cannabis game is because of systemic racism over generations. People were dispossessed of the fruits of their labor, of all of their work. And, you know, that's why the, um, we, we see so few melanated rich kids playing in the cannabis game. Wow. Yes, speak that truth, Omar. No, for sure. <laughs> I think, okay, so California right now is like a microcosm of what potentially can happen also at the federal level, right? So right now, like I said, we have local equity programs and then there is um, an equity act of 2018 by Senator Bradford, which is SB 1294 that per provides financial help to um, jurisdictions that adopt equity programs. So if the federal government can adopt something like that, where it's like, okay, you guys are still implementing in your own way, but we can allocate some funds for you if you adopt equity programs. It's something that I think is a great incentive. Um, I don't like, like I don't hope, I'm like what I also, do, sorry. Let's not present it that way. Language, language matters. So I do hope that um, that um, the federal level also encourages cooperative structures because like Omar had said, the co-ops had been taken away from the California model. Um, and I know that a lot of other businesses around the country, as far as like being inclusive of, you know, more black, brown and black um, communities is tr are trying to support cooperative uh, frameworks because it does in fact help to generate uh, like to build generational wealth opportunities for people um, and so if our federal government can also uh, take that in consideration and make it so all the jurisdictions have to allow you know like um, allow for um, again lowered barriers to entry so like the federal policy has to make it like 
and that's what we're actually looking for at the state level too. And it's part of like the budget. Um, I know I'm jumping around, but there's so many things that have happened within the last week and they're all just starting to connect the dots. Cause there was just like recently, like two days ago, um, uh, the budget finance committee had put forth like what um, the BCC budget was going to potentially look like. And they put a director of equity within that, right? And so what we're hoping for is that now at the state level, it'll help to push the local incentives that are happening. Because even though um, the state dollars had come down to the localities, again, we're, we're seeing um, Los Angeles only beginning to have that trickle down into its people recently, even though those funds were administered like a year ago. You know what I mean? So we're the looking at that is the lack of the infrastructure. You know, we moved forward with these laws without any infrastructure to execute them. Um, Big part then also is that whatever the rollout is on federal policy is that it happens after they build the plane because it is a very dangerous thing to build a plane while you're flying it, right? Because like, where the hell are you gonna get the materials while you're up in the sky, right? So um, it's, it's a dangerous feat. So another thing that uh, we'd be looking for is like the rollout of federal policy to happen years after they actually like laid forth some, some infrastructure. And of course, continue to have, you know, like some things that can be implemented right away you know, which would potentially be fund allocation for for states that have adopted equity programs as part of their framework, right? Obviously, you see, I have a consistent line that we're pushing here. Um, well, let me, we're almost out of time, so let me read one more question from the chat. Yes, yes, yes. Um, can I, can I add, just before we move on? Super important to have tax credits for medical cannabis donations uh, for you know patients and for veterans. And that is something that I would love to see in federal legislation. And that is something that um, I like to refer to as part of the ethics of cannabis and how we need to enforce ethics and cannabis policy to address um, the patients, to address the prison prisoners and um, this equity ecosystem. So uh, if, if we can all stay a little bit longer, we only have about um, five minutes, but we can continue the questions until we're done, if you're able to stay. Um, so the next question is, I'm curious to hear from the panelists regarding the role of law enforcement in helping to minimize environmental impacts from cultivation. Unfortunately, from a perspective of water use, we are in a historic drought, as Cristel said, and it is likely to become the new normal. Uh, the drought, that is. Um, so what do the panelists think of the role of law enforcement for stopping illegal diversions, um, especially in the Emerald Triangle, even amongst licensed community? Well, water diversions by the licensed community would result in license suspension or revocation. And I think that they need to, uh, there needs to be like consistent enforcement because right now we have like sporadic enforcement and, you know, Criminal enforcement doesn't really solve the issues. We understand that, you know, prohibition doesn't work. It's like squeezing the balloon or playing whack-a-mole and trying to like go after these individualized, you know, growers. I think the solution is going to be like greater reform, reducing barriers to entry, reducing the tax burden and the over-regulation so that the illicit market cannot outcompete the regulated market. You know, just because the um, regulated market is so anti-competitive is because we have such a thriving illicit market. But, and by that, I mean, it's just like the barriers to entry are huge. The regulations are vast. The tax burden is ridiculous, like Nina said. And when you add in uh, internal revenue code section 280, where you cannot de deduct your ordinary and usual business expenses at a federal level, it becomes like super thin margins. So the revenues might be great, but the margins, you know, the actual profits are minimal. And so th that's a wide misconception about the cannabis industry that, you know, the operators are swimming in money and uh, the ones who are like doing everything right are operating on very thin margins and they have incredible levels of efficiency. They're like wonders of, you know, capitalism when you look at some of these small, you know, businesses, the craft cultivators and distributors that I know. Yeah, there are some existing best management practices for cultivation that the resource conservation districts have put out. And resource conservation districts exist across the nation. So um, I hope that 
that is something that policymakers and all of us just can be aware of is um, the existing organizations that are doing the work and they're already putting out guidelines um, for cultivators to follow. Uh, one last question uh, for Cristal. The, uh, the audience asks, Cristal mentioned the energy and water use of indoor cultivation. My company runs an energy efficiency incentive program for growers. What do you see as the primary barriers for growers to install energy efficient equipment and how best can we help make this happen? You know, I have to say that it's definitely like, sorry, it starts from this insatiable need for labor. And I mean, it's like, I, I picture them drooling every day because I mean, I, I've been with this company for two years and in the beginning, let's just say it took two entire days to harvest one room. Today, it takes two hours to harvest two rooms. And so our rate of work has, has increased. The fact that there is that lack of infrastructure, we talked about building the plane, we're, we're building it as we go. So it perpetuates this, this insatiable need for labor, right? And so um, with the enforcement part piece, I want to mention, I don't think it should be police. It should be this newly new branch of government, the BCC, because let me tell you, they're not going after the huge the huge ones, you know, we're, we're oh, we have 5,000 5, gallon room floods and, you know, it's just like whatever, you know? And so it's very difficult to imagine that regulation happening, but it's so critical because at this point, part of it is sort of that kind of 215, we do what we need to do, we do what we want to do. Nobody's really regulating us because it seems that the BCC is focusing their efforts more on these illegal um, um, grows and really hands off with us so-called really legal grows who have a lot of political advantage, you know, white privilege and a historical, you know, the company I work for has really deep roots um, up in Sonoma County. So, you know, it is difficult. And I think that it would have to be highly incentivized. And the only incentive now is profits. We've gone from cultivating these incredible cultivars, right? Uh, gorgeous strains with incredible terpene profiles to only selecting strains that test at like 30% or more we don't consider anything else, you know, and the turnaround, you know, 62 days, no, let's cut it at 50. So I think any energy savings, you know, mindset would have to come with a really huge incentive for the company itself, because right now money ain't a thing. It kind of feels like, like, oh, it's okay. Half a million bucks, who cares? You know, and it seems like the city really loves that. I mean, they're getting paid. So we have to create accountability at, you know, a local level with, and then, with the communities that are surrounding to be more responsible partners because we just sort of use, use, use and really don't give back. Yeah, the, the demand for cannabis is only going to increase. Um, as the consumers become more knowledgeable, as you know, different consumer groups are reached, as the prices go down um, across the country, this is going to be you know, maybe the most in-demand product that we see um, over the next decade. So it's really important for us before federal legalization happens to fine tune what's happening at this local level. And so I thank all three of you of the advocacy, the time, the energy, and the work that you've put into your communities, into your um, your special line of expertise. Um, I'm glad to be in conversation with you and have you as resources as we inform academic research and scientific um, data. So uh, we're at 1.01 p.m. I don't see any more questions. Um, any final words from any of you? You know, I, I think the reason we have such a burdensome uh, system at the state level is because we were worried about federal intervention. And so we wanted a system that was like leakage proof that would keep the feds out of California. When federal legalization happens, that whole rationale collapses. And so, you know, we should start reimagining now what it would be like if we are no longer worried about federal intervention into California system, because we don't have to have the current system that really you know, it excludes many of the people who are impacted most by the drug war, who don't have the capital to jump into a regulated cannabis. And, right. you know, I think we're going to see some changes. So it's very exciting to be time to be studying this. I agree. Cristal, any final words? 
No, just thank you. I'm so, I feel so edified after speaking, listening to each of you. I feel really reinvigorated to move forward in our work and thankful that you guys gave us the time and all of your knowledge. Thank you so much. Nina, any final words? Thank you. The no, same as everybody else is just thank you for the for the time and space and for um, those that are in the audience that are super interested in um, in what's uh, happening. Please follow uh, Equity Sessions. So at Equity Sessions on Instagram uh, for stuff that's happening locally in um, in uh, San Francisco and in California. And then uh, to kind of stay up with myself as well, uh, it's a um, Thank you, Laura, uh, at, and also at Nina underscore Parks. Uh, we will be rolling out, which is a whole different conversation that maybe we can come back here for at a, at, um, a different time. But uh, for those in here doing research, like please think about the lens in which you are doing the research with, um, does it have a racial equity diversion, a diversity and inclusion uh, framework that's attached to that research? Um, it's really important um, as we go forward and as Omar said, into this changing world that uh, we have people looking through a new way. So that's it. Thank you for your time, everybody. So as I mentioned, this is the last webinar of the spring semester. We'll be back in the fall. So be sure to check our website periodically, crc.berkeley.edu, where we will be posting uh, videos of this webinar and other past webinars and um, publications from our researchers, science briefs that are short summaries of our research, videos, and other multimedia uh, resources. So thank you so much. Have a great day. And thank you for your time. Thank you.